Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to the, well, my first live stream in quite some time, um, but the first Malware Mondays live stream. And I'm really excited that you're here and uh, hoping that everything goes well. I've got the chat open. So if anything is not coming through that is audio or video, please let me know. I'll try to adjust it on the fly. I haven't been this nervous for a live stream in quite some time. I've added OBS as an intermediate layer, or at least the, the software I'm using to stream this. And it is my first time really using OBS. Um, and uh, I guess part of my approach to things sometimes is just to, to jump in head first and uh, figure it out as I go. And of course that doesn't always work, but here we are. So um, let's get started then. Got a couple of screens here. Um, today, as I said, we are the first Malware Monday. Um, and so our, our goal here, and if you're not really sure, if, you've, if you're coming across this live stream, you're not really sure what it was, or maybe you're finding the recording, then um, what the idea behind Malware Mondays is that I will produce an artifact at the beginning of the week, probably on Monday, uh, that will allow us to focus on a particular malware family or tool or tactic or technique or kind of all of the above. Um, I'm going to host these here on my site. So as you can see, here is our, our goal for today, um, analyzing Procmon data. And with this, you'll find the goals, what I plan to cover. So hopefully there's no real surprises here and our analysis objectives. So if you want to, and probably the most important or what I, what I hope is the most beneficial for these is that you can identify or you can download these artifacts as you can see here in the screenshot. Um, and then you can try to analyze them before the live stream or follow along during the live stream and we'll answer those questions. Um, I do plan to keep these live streams relatively focused. So that is today we're gonna focus just mainly on Procmon. Um, and as we identify some gaps, maybe in what the tool can, can or cannot do and our ability to, to do our analysis, then I'll, you know, we'll add in those tools and, and add in those different techniques as this series progresses throughout the year. Um, Okay, so uh, with that then, uh, you'll likely also see for a lot of these artifacts, um, at least if I think there's something relevant, I will uh, create something like how this artifact was made. So for example, I've given you a PML file or a Procmon uh, event or data capture file, um, and it's, I thought it was, it was interesting or worthwhile to have a video that just shows you how I captured that data. Um, if I got into all of the details in this live stream, then the live stream gets long, and I'm, I'm hoping to keep these around 15 to, to 20 minutes. I guess we'll see. The timer has started. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so anything else? Uh, you know, I might I might produce some additional videos here that you can get some additional insight into kind of what went in. I I, I was kind of thinking of it like a behind the scenes. That seems maybe a little a little silly, but uh, anyways. Um, but I'll, future episodes, I'll post to social media. I'll add a post here to the site and. Uh, Hopefully these will continue. So your feedback along the way is very much appreciated. Whether you leave that in comments in the video here, the live stream as it's live or the comments below after the recording is done or the live stream is done, um, find me on social media and send me a message or any place that I'm lurking or, or, or out about. So I really do appreciate that feedback and ideas as well as to what would be good topics to cover. Um, with that being said, Okay, we'll get into the VM here. Uh, as you can see, I'm using a, a slightly modified Flare VM. The only modification I made was I changed the desktop. So I added my logo or a logo that I had Gemini, Google's AI helped me create. Um, outside of that, it is a you know a basic Windows VM with the Flare VM installation ran on top of it. So therefore a Flare VM. If you're new to reversing and malware analysis, this is a great VM to help you get started. There's a GitHub project page for you, as well as a video that I have already on my channel to help you with installation. So definitely worth checking out uh, the Flare VM as a uh, you know member of the Flare team. It's my go-to, it's my daily driver. I use it for all my analysis and all my training at this point as well. Now, uh, when it comes to the tooling, um, we're gonna be taking a look at Procmon and Let's see if here I get the zoom to work. Um, and a default Flare VM, that's going to be added as a shortcut. Oh my, sorry about all the zooming there. <clears throat> so uh, it's the icon here and the, the taskbar that has the little graph. And, and I think of that just as uh, something that, uh, you know, as it's capturing data, um, you know, that's the amount of data that's being captured. So it's pretty easy to identify. Of course, you can hit the Windows button and search for it. 
uh, Procmon or Process Monitor. I'm just going to call it Procmon for this session, as most people, you know, most most folks that use it do. It is from Sysinternals, and if you haven't checked out the Sysinternals suite of tools, they are a set of Windows operating system or Windows tools that cover a wide variety and wide range of uses and capabilities. So definitely something that we'll likely explore the many different tools, or at least those that are relevant to you know, performing malware analysis and some reverse engineering activity. Um, to get started, because I've provided a PML, and you can see on the desktop, that the icon has associated itself with Procmon, then I'm just gonna double click that. And that will open up Procmon for us. We could launch it down below. Um, the only catch with launching it from down below is that when you launch Procmon that way, that is you open it without a PML file, uh, it's gonna start capturing right away. So I don't have to do that, but if I did, and I talk about that in the behind the scenes video, oftentimes I'm going to launch it and then stop that capture. Now you'll see, because I've opened up Procmon previously, we have this filter dialog. And that is a bunch of filters that I've set that we're gonna talk about today. So in this case, and in any case where you've already opened up Procmon and you wanna reset those, we can just hit, of course, the reset button located here. And that will reset it back to its default state. Um, You'll notice that that doesn't remove all filters, right? And that's something that you'll notice throughout our usage of Procmon is that Procmon does come with a default set of filters that helps to eliminate, um, you know, activity, say, from Procmon itself and other events that they, the authors are, are very confident we're not going to care about. <clears throat> I really, when we get into our Procmon usage, uh, you're going to see that Just check in chat. Every once in a while, I get really paranoid. Like I just was looking at my OBS and I thought, oh, I never switched screens. I, I do that very regularly, um, but no, I did. I, hopefully everybody sees my desktop anyway. That's what OBS is telling me I'm presenting. I guess I can check YouTube studio. Oh, okay. I, mean, I, I tell you this thing, this live stream had me anxious <laughs> all week. Um, so with the, the filtering, um, that's really gonna really boil down to the core of how we use Procmon um, is that we're going to you know capture a lot of data uh, Procmon's going to capture all the data. It doesn't discriminate. When we run Procmon on the system, it just starts gathering information. And then we come in with these filters to narrow down what we're looking at. So hit reset. I'm going to apply or go to OK. And uh, that'll take us now to our default Procmon view. Now, you'll see um, I zoomed in. So hopefully everybody can see this OK. Uh, I've got the fonts up. I've got the zoom in. So it's a little crowded here. But I think all the important information is available. Um, one of the first areas that I'll, I'll point out, if you look down in the lower left-hand corner, um, here is, it's showing, I, I don't know why my Zoom is being really tricky today. It worked great every time I practiced this, and now it's really touchy and not working the way I expected. I guess that's what challenge with going live, <laughs> right? Um, but hopefully you can see that. It's showing 483,000 events out of 655,000. So um, there's kind of two things to take note of here. One, those default filters are relevant. They are applying some filtering. And two, that's a lot of events, right? When you just open the, the PML file as we're doing, um, or if you're creating a raw capture, there's a lot of information. And, and a lot of this is likely not going to be relevant or germane to our investigation, to the malware that we're analyzing. So that's where we wanna be able to filter that down because I don't want to have to, um, yeah, I wanna, I wanna cut out as many of these events as possible to just focus on what's important. Now, if you look up at the top, you'll see there are a number of icons. One icon that I think is really helpful is this, it looks to me more like a network indicator, uh, but it is for the process tree. So we can open that up and thank you all for the, the feedback there as well. Um, you'll see that it has actually a display that's going to look very similar to Process Explorer. And if you haven't worked with Process Explorer, that will probably without a doubt be on our list of tools at some point in time this year. Um, the idea here is that we have on our left-hand side, we have the process tree. So we have the parent-child relationship that's indicated by the, the kind of the nesting and the hierarchy. And then you have information then to the right about that process. Now, when I'm initially 
going through Procmon data, a lot of times this is happening very quickly. Right? I just need to identify process activity, possibly process names or PIDs. And so I don't have to take a lot of time to do a bunch of investigation here. This happens relatively quick. But because we're learning about it, of course, I'm being ver more ver verbose. And so it is going to take us a little bit more time. Um, you'll notice if we scroll all the way up, right, we've got a lot of processes here. And if it helps you to condense these, go ahead. But really what we're focused or want to focus on is what's happening under explorer.exe. That's typically going to be what is controlling things that are executed under your desktop. When I ran this malware, I ran it from the desktop. Now, you'll also see other processes. So VM tools, there's the Zoomit that is fighting me a little bit today. There's our Procmon. Uh, here's an instance of cmd.exe, so the terminal. And that was used to run FakeNet. So yeah, I had FakeNet running. I didn't provide the PCAP, so don't worry about that. I think we'll talk about the PCAP and network activity in our next stream, because I think that'll help connect some dots here that we're not quite gonna be able to put together. Um, and we can close those if we want. Uh, finally, we have this instance, cmd.exe, and then there is Procmon, UTSYSC, schedule tasks, run DLL, right? So, so here, and really one of the first analysis objectives, is to identify the process, and, and this is it. Now, you have kind of two options, I suppose, right? I opened up a cmd.exe instance, navigated to the desktop, and executed the malware. So you could start or use that as the base for your filter, I suppose. Uh, I typically don't, and I don't see a reason to do that. It just potentially adds more events to the tool and the data here that you don't. I don't want to get distracted by. So. This, Procmon underscore Amade, I also made it kind of obvious, hopefully, uh, with a PID of 4988, this is a good place to start. Now, um, before I start filtering events, uh, I would, since I'm already in the process tree, take a few minutes and just analyze what's going on with these processes. For example, um, Procmon Amade.exe appears to, or doesn't appear to, it did launch this UTSYSC.exe. And as we select those processes, you'll notice there is a command right here uh, that shows us the command line. So a couple of things jump out here. One is the location, right? Where does this child process get launched from? Well, it's under the user's temp directory at a, you know, what appears to me to be an arbitrarily named or probably randomly, semi, somewhat randomly generated folder, uh, and then the name of the executable. So this is a good first kind of host-based indicator, right? We have where it's where it appears to be mm, dropping another payload. It's likely at this stage a copy of itself, right? <clears throat> and something that I always keep in mind going into these analysis is that oftentimes there is a you know somewhat predictable though not guaranteed sequence of events. That is, we'll have unpacking, and part of the unpacking process might involve dropping itself, copying or moving itself, or dropping actual next stage payloads. Um, then we have persistence. Then we might have a check-in to a C2 command and control server, and then follow on commands. And in the case of something that has modular capability, maybe then additional payloads get downloaded. Um, Amade actually follows that pattern pretty well. So when we're looking at this activity here, I'm suspecting at this point that it's probably a part of its unpacking and then its relocation for eventual persistence. Um, now, how I could confirm that or why or where, where I would confirm that, something that we're gonna miss with just the PML data is uh, we can't just go to the file system, right? If I had captured this in the VM that I also ran or executed or detonated the malware on, well, then we could right click no, oh, not in here. I guess we'll do it in the other view. But we could go to the file system and actually investigate, in which case then I would get a hash of my original malware, a hash of this file, and compare the two. If they're the same, then I know that it just copied itself as part of its unpacking persistence process. Um, that is the case here, right? But that's data that I'm missing. And I, I guess maybe it's in Procmon somewhere. I, I typically, when I want that information, I go to the artifacts themselves, which I, which I didn't provide. So that is something to keep in mind and something I would definitely investigate uh, to have as part of my analysis. Is this a new artifact? Is this a new executable or is it the same? Yes, see you, Jerry. Great that you were here. I'm new to all this live stream stuff. I'm used to going into like 
presentation mode in which I, I, I shut out the world and I just focus on talking. <laughs> so uh, b bear with me. I, I promise there'll be more and I hope to get better at them. So, uh, okay, so that's something. Um, now we can see that schedule tasks, uh, right, the name is very subjective if you weren't familiar with it. It is launched by UTSYSC, right? And so that just that pattern alone leads me to believe that, okay, all right, this has now been relocated. It is it is further along and and maybe even past the unpacking process because we're starting to see evidence of persistence. Uh, schedule tasks, if we highlight that, this is a good one in which the command line will reveal its secrets. So this is a legitimate binary within Windows. You can see it's located under C Windows System 32, and it's the command line arguments here that we're the most interested in. Um, you gotta, sometimes, because the, the information here will get truncated, you can highlight and basically scroll. Um, so you can take a look at some of these arguments. These are all actually very well documented on MSDN, the Microsoft Developer Network. So if you're not familiar, and I always forget, um, some of them are obvious, you can kind of reason out, some of them maybe not so much. But you can go ahead, you can look those up. Uh, essentially what this is doing is it's creating a scheduled task that's going to run every minute. It's going to have a name of utsysc.exe and probably the area of this command that I'm the most interested in at this point in my analysis is this right here. Where is the path? And the path is to the binary that we saw that was the original binary that was just copied or moved, right? So nothing new in the sense of an additional executable file payload, you know, piece of malware, but um, certainly we have another good indicator in that the schedule task gets created and it uses the same name as the binary that gets dropped. Now, how do we know if this changes? Well, you can run the sample multiple times and, and that's what I did in this case. Every time it ran, utsysc.exe was the same. Uh, now I don't remember if these changed, but likely they did because they were something that was probably automatically generated, which means this was likely part of a config or something. And this could change over time, but if in this particular instance, this particular sample, it's consistent, um, that can just help with creating detections or hunt rules or any other uh, information that you're, you're gonna provide as a report to other colleagues. All right, so it's okay to, of course, to run these multiple times to get some insight and make some assessments. Now, would you know or would I be able to say that out with 100% confidence? Mm, you know, maybe not. Um, but in order to do that would require probably a little more time getting into the binary itself, doing a little reverse engineering, and that might not be something that I have time for right now, right? So I'm okay with the assessment saying it likely will use this name or it uses this name and... You know, if I saw in observations that this is randomly generated, then I could also do that saying something like it follows a, you know, a, a character length of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten characters using alphabetic. You know, alphabetic characters, ten characters in length, something along those lines. All right, so I'm going to keep going here. I'll try to get to some of the questions here as we wrap things up, just so I don't get too far off topic. Um... Okay, so that's an instance here, command line, very helpful, and we're all just getting it in the process tree. Uh, some of the processes, like the console host, that's just part of Windows doing Windows things, right? And, and so if you're not familiar, just like with using Procmon, the data can at times be very overwhelming. And part of the art of using this tool and utilizing it effectively is start to building up those sort of those mental filters and saying, okay, I know when something is not really relevant to the analysis that I'm performing. So that's an instance here. Now run DLL32 is very interesting because that is another built-in utility within the operating system. As you see here, it typically resides at C Windows System 32. And we gotta scroll this one out a little bit, but you'll notice that it is an attempt to run a DLL. So we have another, looks like another unique path under app data roaming and then this another randomly generated looking name, and the DLL itself, as well as the entry point export. So cred64.dll, that name is very subject, su suggestive and that it is probably a credential harvesting DLL. It looks like it's part of a modular capability and I would suspect comes from a download, right? But I don't know, I mean, it could be embedded in the binary at this point in our analysis. We're, we can't make 
I wouldn't feel comfortably being 100% positive if I had no prior knowledge of this particular malware and I didn't have anything else that I was monitoring. You saw FakeNet was running earlier, right? FakeNet gives us insight into the network traffic. If we, were, if we had FakeNet open, we would have seen an HTTP request for this DLL. Okay, so we want to start filtering data. Right? I think an easy way to do that is to select our primary process, and then down below, you can say either include process or include subtree. So I'm going to include subtree because that's going to essentially create those filters and provide me with activity associated with not only Procmon, but all of these children processes. Okay, so now that we've done that, include subtree, we'll click close. Um, how can we use filters? We're ready to do that now. And now we can start using filters. So you'll notice, again, I like to always glance down at the um, event window. It's, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like my throttle, <laughs> you know, how fast are we going? How much data are we trying to consume here? And you'll see that by including that subtree, we've significantly reduced our events. We're down to now 17% of the total events captured 115,000, but 115,000 is still a lot. And as you look at the results here, you can just use your eyeballs. You'll see one of the columns is process name. Right? And if we scroll up and down, you'll notice now that that process name are all of the processes relevant to what we were just analyzing. So there's still a lot of data. Now, the main window here, before we get into filtering, you'll see is, you know, to a certain degree, self-explanatory. The leftmost column is time of day. Then we have process name. Then we have process ID. We have operation. And operation is going to be really helpful because we're going to use that not only to understand as sort of the entry point of the data that we're analyzing, what is this event? But then we'll also use it for our filtering. And then depending on what you see in the operation, you'll have different values, notes, data, arguments, example, uh, et cetera, right here in the path. So um, let's go ahead, we'll open up the filters and you'll see up above here in Procmon's list of icons, the little filter, it looks like a filter, probably one of the most aptly iconed shortcut out there. And that'll bring up this process monitor filter, which is, which is where we started just a few minutes ago. Um, now we have these PID filters in place, right? And if you recall, I said that by, by including subtree from the process explorer, it just set filters. So that's where these filters are coming from and why they're here. All of these other filters, these are the default added by Procmon. So if you're interested in those, you can take a look at them. I'll leave that though as a, an adventure for the viewer. Um, if we want to disable a filter, you can just uncheck and then you'll be able to click apply. You'll see that right down there. That will disable it, but keep it active. If you select a filter, you'll be able to, if you want to completely remove it, you'll see there's the remove button up above. All right, so I definitely want these PID filters in place at this point in time. Okay, now when it comes to applying filters, um, there's a lot that we could cover here. And, there, and there's a lot that we could cover in this tool in general. So as I, I guess, try to sort of guide everyone in that this will be a, a basic. This is going to be how I use it for 85% you know, of my use cases just to start, kickstart my analysis. Um, the next then is to kind of whittle down these events a little bit further. So we have up above... You can see here this first drop down. This is going to, to determine kind of the primary category of filter that we're creating. You'll see there is one for parent PID or PID. If you wanted to add those manually, you certainly could do that. There's a number of different types here or options. But for today, all I really need is operation. Okay, once operation is selected, then we'll have in the center column another drop down that just helps us to determine how we want our condition or our event to match so you'll have things like is is not less than more than begins with so you can explore that um, i'm just going to leave it as is so i'm going to say operation is much like we already have with our pid pid is and then a value if it matches show it filter out everything that doesn't match um, we're going to continue to to you know work off of that approach uh, once we select operation the 
third dropdown will then populate with relevant options. And this is where, again, things can become pretty overwhelming if you just scroll through this and you've never really looked at it before. Maybe you're new to malware analysis and you just, you know, it's, it, it can be, it can be overwhelming because you don't know exactly where to start. Now, these options are going to more or less match up to Windows functionality, Windows API calls. And what I find to be in a very helpful way for this initial analysis is to filter off of events that have created a modification to the operating system. Some of them are temporary, some of them are more permanent. For example, if we look for process creation, that can be a little more temporary. But I like that because that means that the, you know, the process, that malware that we begin analyzing, as you saw with the process tree, if it's creating additional processes, those can oftentimes be valuable. So we can add that as an event. And we just have to click the add button right here. Once we're ready to add it as a filter, and then it'll be added as a filter. Now we can delete it or toggle it as being active or not using that checkbox. Okay, um, another is file creation. And this one can be a little misleading and that if you go to, let's see here, we have create file. That seems like a really good candidate, right? Create file API or the create file event. Maybe that creates a file, but unfortunately it is maybe a, a little bit of a misnomer and that create file, well, it will create a file, but it also will just simply obtain a handle or access to a file that already exists. So, how I work around that is I go down to the bottom and I use write file, right? If it's going to create a new file, then likely if there's anything valuable there, it's also going to write to the file. So you can add that one. Um, there is, you see these are, are largely grouped. For example, if we look at the registry, you'll see that the reg prefix helps to identify all of the different options here for registry activity. So out of all of these, <clears throat> reg set value is usually the one that is a good starting point. Okay, so I'm gonna go back, do that reg set value. There we go, so I'll add that. Um, and then the last one, and this one, again, just a little bit of a, I didn't know until I knew, um, file deletion. That can also be helpful to understand. And so, um, let's see, where did I find that one? right here, set disposition information file. These are a couple of APIs and these aren't the only ones. And in fact, I was, I meant to include a little bit more. There was a pretty good Stack Overflow article I was reading just before this that talked about other Procmana events that you could filter on. But for this, for this stream, for this sample, this one works well. Um, and what will happen then is this can get used as an API call to mark a file for deletion and, and eventually see it deleted. So I'm going to grab that one and set disposition information file, add it, and then I'll apply. Okay. And what I'm hoping to see is, as you might have noticed, I'm going to click OK just to close this window for now, that our filters have gone down to 52 out of 655,000. So we seem to be working ourselves into the right direction. So I'm, I'm always... Uh, pleased to see that, right? <laughs> a lot, lot less stuff to investigate here. Um, now, on a side note, oh yeah, 20 minutes, right. <laughs> I can never do anything in 20 minutes. Uh, you can go under the filter file menu option and you can actually save filters. So something that you could consider is to take all of these filters. I would, I would delete the process ID ones, right? Because these PIDs are unique to this particular execution of this malware or this file. Um, but if you just save these as a filter, well, then you can name it, you know, baseline or default or something. And you don't, you don't have to go through and add these manually every time. You can just go to your filter and say load filter and something will pop out here and it'll give you your filter set. So that, that's a good way, I think, of doing it to save yourself some time. You know, you, you install something like the Flare VM, it gets all the tools there, everything's great. And then as you use it, you make small modifications to this. And this could be something that I would include. Come in here before I create my baseline snapshot, uh, customize Procmon, then create the baseline snapshot, the thing I always revert to when I start some new analysis, just to help save some time. And then if you load that filter, 
you include the subtree from the processes, right? Now you've, you've done all of this that we've just talked about a lot quicker. And then you can, you can fine tune your filtering as you need. Okay, so what's left is just to analyze our information. And you can see that there's still quite a bit here, right? There's still 52 events. And this really still falls in that category of, is everything relevant? And, and the answer is no, not everything is, is relevant. For example, right away, we start off with this operation reg set value. And you might think, ooh, it's this malware because it is coming from procmon um, It's doing something with all of these different values here. Let me squish that down. All these different register keys. But more than likely what is happening and what is happening in this case is that there are there's going to be APIs that are called that sort of as a byproduct of their execution, they do and interact and maybe even modify parts of the operating system. So this is a good example of that in that there was a call somewhere in here um, that caused, you know, as, as part of its execution, these set values to run. And, and you know, I don't know if there's a, a great way to say, if you see this pattern, you can recognize that behavior other than you just start to recognize these as less interesting or very, you commonly see them. Um, if I was really, really into Procmon every single day of my life, I would probably have a more concrete answer, right? But I'm, I'm trying to be realistic in how I'm presenting this and that I, I don't know, oftentimes I don't know. There just, there's only so much time in a day. Um, and some of these things I just have to say, okay, yeah, that looks like, you know, activity that's just related to or as a byproduct of another API call. What I'm really interested in is this call to write file. Um, we do then get to this call to write file. And this isn't anything now that we haven't already discovered because this particular write file is writing or copying itself, right? So we already saw this in the process tree, the process activity. Um, had that not been, or had this been a file not related to the process or creation of a process, then this would be probably the first time we were discovering that. So it makes sense, we have all these write files and then eventually a process create. You can right click on these and you'll see in this context menu, I mentioned we could jump to the file system. Well, there's the jump to or control J. So if we had these artifacts still in the VM, we could jump to those locations. <clears throat> I mean, we can still jump to those locations if they exist, uh, but, um, but this particular file doesn't exist, nor does this directory on this system. Uh, you have the ability to add additional filtering Right, so exclude events before and after, um, edit a filter, include, exclude, highlight, calls to write file, which should just help with your analysis using Procmon. Um, oh, I wanna go back, you can just double click on these two. That'll bring up this properties window. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and you'll just see information about that particular event. Uh, in this case, you'll see information about the data that was written. Not really all that helpful here in my opinion um, because we, we know what it was. It was a copy. It was a copy of itself. Um, but, you know, if I didn't know, I might look at this just to see how much actual data was written. Uh, again, I'd likely have access to the artifact. So I would go and investigate that and not spend a ton of time here in the properties. Um, there's the process create. We could double click on that. You'll see there's the command line. So if for some reason you missed it in the process tree or you start here instead, nothing says you have to start with the process tree. Here we have the command line. Really nothing interesting there. Um, <clears throat> and then we get a little bit further where eventually there's this call or we transition sort of our process activity, right? Procmon, Amade, our original process is exiting. These events are related to that. And then our UT process begins. So we could at this point, you know, we've extracted some data. Maybe we have some additional artifacts to investigate. Ready to move on though, we could exclude those events before just to help clean up and, and sort of use this as almost like a to-do list. Like I've already looked at that data, so I'm gonna filter it out and I'm only gonna focus on what's left. Um, okay, here we have more reg set values and you'll see that we have a repeat, right? Same values that were set above, which to me is another indicator that it's just part of an API call. This first one though does stand out. 
And the reason that it stands out is because these are some of the you know, more common registry path locations that can be modified for persistence. And these you just, I, I think you start to recognize by looking at articles, by doing the investigation, by doing the research, right? If you, if you never knew any of the registry before, you start analyzing something like this, you go, okay, well, what is, what is this and what is this? And you'll eventually, through the process of elimination, figure it out. I think the easier path is to simply um, look up, okay, what, what are common registry paths abused for persistence? And this would be one that will come up. We can double click on this, and you'll see that as the name sort of implies here, uh, the startup, user shell folder startup, it is providing this path. And that's the path that we already discovered for where our, our dropped or our copied binary is located. Okay, um, then we see a call to process create. We already explored that. Again, we can double click and get the command line arguments. What is the name of the scheduled task? Where is the binary located? Those are typically the things that I'm the most interested in. Where could I tell others if you needed to sweep someone's environment to look for indicators of infection by this malware? Okay, more of these are gonna fall into that, um, kind of that content of I suspect that they are just a byproduct of an API. So seeing this reg set value here, for example, internet settings cache, Right? Not only do I suspect that, that is part of an API call, but also that there was likely some internet connectivity or some internet activity here. Um, and, and that's just because of you know, the, the internet settings, cache, history, cache prefix. I'm just trying to take the name and as quickly as possible make some inferences from it. There is a way to know for sure, and that is to take that value, look it up, and do the research. But Oftentimes, uh, you're, you're going to be, you know, you, you can't chase every, every possible lead that you, you come across. And so you're trying to also be somewhat expedient. Uh, that leads us to another write file. And what's interesting about this one is, let me go back to my filters, because I know, because I looked at this before, I'm expecting a certain API. So I'm gonna go back here and let's go to operation is and set, disp uh, set disposition information EX. Maybe that's the one I missed. Okay, looks like it, yeah, that's definitely the one. Um, so you'll find with the Microsoft naming convention, there'll be a lot of API or function names that have different suffixes such as EX or A or W. They're just different, essentially different versions of the same API. So I oftentimes will include both to not get into all the details there. So if you see, for example, I had I had originally added a filter for set disposition information um, file. Well, if I see that there's also a set disposition information file EX, I should have just done both. And that's like that's typically what I do. Um, so what does this tell us? Well, this tells us that a file was created. It's, it's, a, it's a different location than we've seen. It's right in the user's temp folder. And it looks like it's just a, another randomly named file. And then there is this set disposition information EX. And if we look at the events here, you'll see that one of the flags is for file disposition delete. So it created a file and deleted it all here within this short period of time. So what is the file? Well, it's deleted, right? So even if we were on the system that we infected, we don't necessarily know what that artifact is. So we'd have to take a different approach if we wanted to capture what the file is. Maybe it's a screenshot, it's being sent as part of a C2, maybe it's just temporary information that's collected. It's, it's hard to say, right? We, we, we don't really, I mean, we can speculate, but I don't think in this case speculation really helps. So. That would be something that I would probably mark off on my list of things to do. Do I need to know more about this file? Do I have time to figure more about this file? I'll investigate it a little bit later, take a slightly different approach. Um, as we're kind of rounding out our Procmon capture, the next but a flurry of activity, we can, we can kind of cheat, right? We can look ahead and see there's one more process. That's our run DLL32. So if we look at the events before that, you have more write file activity and we have what appears to be you know, caching 
activity from the API that downloaded this file, as well as then the file itself. So here is our, our uh, cred64.dll, as well as the location or the directory that this malware created in order to drop those payloads into. And then run dll, as we saw previously, it's using the two arguments, or maybe the one argument, it depends on how you want to look at it, but it needs the path to the DLL and then the entry point, right? And probably again, the, at this part of the analysis, the most important thing is just that we identify, oh, this, this looks modular, the name is very suggestive. Um, if we do nothing, you know, prior knowledge, and we have another location where these plugins could be located. Okay, and that's our sweep through. So a um, lot of different scenarios uh, that you could go through. And I, I would say, like any tool, if, um, you know, if, if it's, it's good to get the practice, to go ahead and, and find, I, I would I would almost say, you know, I have a, a GitHub repository that has source code. Um, you know, look at programs that you know what they do and then compare the results. How does it look like when my program creates a process or writes a file or downloads something from the internet what does that look like now in Procmon? Because you know, you already know the answers. You're just trying to figure out what it looks like in another tool. When it comes to malware, we don't we don't know, right? I have no idea what this malware is going to do until I, until I start investigating it. And I think that's what makes it more challenging than when you have all of this data to start sifting through it. Um, things like these filters, you know, looking for certain events. How is it modifying the system? Will absolutely help, um, but it can still be a, a daunting and, and very sort of unnerving task because it's, it's hard, I think, to build that level of confidence to say, okay, I analyzed this Procmon and here is 100%, I, I guarantee what happened, right? I, I think as reverse engineers, um, you, you'll, you'll see a lot of language like uh, further analysis required or appears to, or it's suspected that because, I mean, this file alone, right? I can't tell you what it does. Well, how does it come up with this name? I don't know, right? It looks random. It's probably generated. I can use experience to help guide that, but I can't say for sure unless I looked at the code itself. Um, okay, awesome. So uh, that is it. Of course, I took twice as long as I thought, so apologize for that. I'll, I, I learned a long time ago not to give time estimates, and then I violated that today. So um, anyways, hopefully you found it useful. Uh, I'm going to try to answer any questions that I have. Um, there's a lot of questions. Well, there could be a lot of questions anyway, maybe not too much, but uh, all URLs are in video description. Yeah, uh, the URLs should be in the video description. If not, I'll make sure to get everything updated. Everything you need is at the website. So um, you'll find the behind the scenes video as well as the PML file. One reason I also opted to do a PML file and no other artifacts is because then I don't have to worry about distributing anybody any malware. Um, I probably should have. I, I don't know if I have it anywhere in the documentation. I'll make sure to add that. I'll make a note. Um, the actual original SHA-2 of the sample. So if you are adventurous and you do want to grab the sample itself, you'll find everything that I'm going to use is going to be free, open source, or available for you to download. So you'll find the sample on Malware Bazaar. Yep, Sys Internals is great. Hey, DFIR Diva getting caught up on my hellos. Um, okay, question about, does malware which use techniques to unlink itself from various process block lists affect the data capture? Um, yeah, that's a great question, and I don't have an answer. Um, I, I do get asked quite a bit about how can different process injection techniques, how can you identify it? Um, does Procmon do good at tracing it, or how could you trace that activity in Procmon, and are there things that malware can do? Yes, I think there's certainly things that malware can do um, to hide itself from this sort of capture activity. So I guess one of the one of the tip-offs I would be looking for in a situation like that would be if I'm running malware um, and in my sandbox and I'm using Procmon and I'm just not observing what I expect. How do I know what I expect? Well, oftentimes I'll bounce things off of different different sandboxing platforms. Like I'll take a sample and if I have access to say triage or any run or my own instance of Cape or Cuckoo, you know, I'll be able to run it and have some idea of what's going to happen. And then if I see some major discrepancies or variations, well, then I can start to suspect some form of anti-analysis, something that might be targeted directly at something like Procmon, or maybe there's other anti-analysis that's getting in the way, hindering my analysis in my VM. Um, so it can get challenging. 
But I, I usually, if, if something's not working the way I expect it, I don't have the time to really drill into the binary using something like IDA. I'll use other sources like a sandbox and then start comparing it and eventually figure out what's the, the best approach. But um, I, don't, I don't know for sure how Procmon handles that. Uh, yeah, time does fly. Great, I'm glad to hear uh, that you learned something new. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so the question about sort of a catch-all. Um, I'm not sure if I would consider these, you know, catch-alls. Uh, for example, write write file. You know, I suspect will catch all write file operations. It's just really the one and only. Um, reg set value. Maybe that's more of a kind of a catch-all. Um, in that, uh, in my experience, that that catches most registry activity that I'm interested in. Um, so I do try to set these as a baseline, as I said, to get kind of my 80, 85 percent solution. This should help jumpstart my analysis with Procmon as I'm trying to gain insight and understanding into what it's doing. Um, there are a lot of filters there, and I, and I would say that for me, I don't use Procmon all the time. Uh, but when I do, these, these are the handful that I typically utilize. And, and then if there's something that is sort of driving my curiosity or there's a lack of indicator or behavior, something seems odd, then I'll, I'll, I'll maybe explore different ways to, to look at the data. Um, I didn't mention networking because typically when I capture network traffic, I'm using something else. I'm using like a fake net and a Wireshark in order to capture the traffic and investigate the traffic. So I don't usually, myself personally, my workflow, I don't use Procmon for networking stuff. So I think we'll cover that probably in the next stream just because I, I think it makes a lot of sense here to connect a few more dots on this sample. Okay, awesome. Well, I think that wraps it up then. Um, Thank you everyone for joining today and for the comments. It was really great to see everyone. Um, really appreciate you being a, a part of the community. So if you have any feedback, please feel free to leave it in the comments. Send me a message directly. I'm, I'm pretty active on social media. Uh, if you go to the website here, you'll find that there is um, a Discord, right? Uh, so I haven't been promoting that too heavily. Uh, but if you do want to join the Discord, um, you know, it'd be great to see you there pretty active in that as well. So that'd be a great place to ask questions. And, and I love questions to get asked that the rest of the community can see, because likely if you're thinking about it or you have a question, somebody else does. So if you ask it in a more public fashion or forum, then others can benefit from the conversation, but certainly feel free to, to send me a DM if that's the case. I'm going to switch my transition. Um, also, if you have any suggestions for the setup, the stream, or anything like that, I also would appreciate that as well. Yeah, I would say definitely. Um, last one of those final comments here. Intuition, intuition plays a role. Um, it just takes it takes a while. It's it's like any profession. There's just a learning curve to it. There's so much information. There's so much work that has to go into learning. Uh, you know everything. I mean, I mean, Procmon is considered sort of a basic tool in a sense, um, but it's not right. It's it's how we use the tool, how we understand the data. Just like just like IDA, IDA is a very advanced tool, but the power of IDA comes in and in, in your ability to understand that the data that is presenting you. So um, it just takes time. And I hope these are helpful. And um, many of these topics we could spend a lot more time on and get into a lot more use cases and even advanced usage. So um, we'll see how long this, I can keep the stream alive. Maybe we'll do that down the road. Okay, awesome. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to sign off for now. I'll see you all in the next live stream, hopefully.